Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. It's a great delight for me to introduce our speaker today, Joel Swisher, who uh, back in the 1990-ish was sitting in your uh, seats and I was lucky enough to be one of his many advisors. Um, normally, uh, seeing a topic like his, the four E's, energy, engineering, education, and everything, I would be worried if there was actually anything interesting and of substance to be talked about. But following Joel's career, where as a grad student, he was probably the first person that actually did a very serious study of carbon offset markets. Now everybody's doing that, but he was the first one. He left here uh, after his PhD and was instrumental, I claim, in Rocky Mountain Energy's movement to direct uh, more direct and active engagement with the business community and as well was well known for that and um, since then he's moved to um, western washington university as and is the director of energy studies uh, there and i just got a chance to get caught up a little bit with him so i'm anxious to see what new adventures he's been on i think he's going to talk about those today so without further ado joel swisher thank you joel and right now, uh, today, as we speak. Um, I've been around Stanford a long time. Uh, this picture shows the demolition 10 years ago of the Terman Engineering Center that was built and opened my junior year. So if that doesn't make you feel bad. Uh, I'd like to start, though, by honoring some um, heroes in, in the energy circle around Stanford, starting with my longtime friend and colleague, the late, great Carl Knapp, who was a pioneer in the solar photovoltaic industry, worked at the city of Palo Alto buying wind power back when it was hard to buy wind power, uh, then later uh, worked at, at Stanford uh, alongside Jane Woodward, uh, who had and continues to support just about everything in energy education uh, here at Stanford. And um, among other things, uh, Carl uh, led the um, courses that took field trips to China. Um, and that was a picture extracted from that. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, another longtime friend and, and mentor, now retired, Professor Gil Masters. And um, Gil taught at Stanford from the early 70s until just uh, a year or two ago when he retired. He taught the Intro Environmental Engineering course taught intro electrical engineering. Um, he also started uh, and taught for many years, uh, really his signature course, CE 176, which became CEE 176 A and B, energy efficient buildings and renewable electricity. And um, I'll, I'll uh, come back to that course again. But Gil was the uh, inspiration for thousands of students uh, who went through his, his courses and his mentorship uh, and went out into the energy profession. If you bump into anyone in, in the field uh, who's been uh, at Stanford and say, well, you know, how did you get into this? They'll say something like, yeah, well, I was a mechanical engineering or computer science major, and then I took Gill's class. Uh, and so um, really one of, one of our heroes, and I'll mention his course again. I hope it's not boring, but I want to recount a little bit of history, in, including my own history, um, partly to set the stage and to kind of explain why I think that I know something about uh, the topic I'm going to uh, discuss. Uh, you all can judge for yourself, of course. Back when I was an undergraduate, energy became an issue that we talked about because of the energy crises and the concern that we might run out of the resource uh, and whether we could keep up with demand or whether we'd have to keep waiting in line uh, to buy fuel. Um, and uh, Elvis met the president. That was a landmark, too. And around that time, people started asking questions about other energy paths uh, and started thinking about energy efficiency, uh, including uh, the late great physicist, I think he was Enrico Fermi's last PhD student, Art Rosenfeld uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, later in the Energy Commission for the state of California. Uh, Ralph Cavana, uh, still active as an attorney at Natural Resources Defense Council and, and uh, architect of many California energy policies, 
California has been in the vanguard, of course, of energy policy going back to the first Jerry Brown administration, uh, back when he had hair and was dating Linda Ronstadt, the singer. Um, and then also our colleague, Amory Lovins, who came up with the idea of the soft path, as he called it, uh, considering energy efficiency as a resource. Um, he too met the president, any uh, resemblance with Elvis is purely coincidental. Amory talked about the idea of energy efficiency in the context of questioning the conventional wisdom at the time uh, around energy supplies. And at the time, the expectation was that energy demand would follow something like that red curve uh, and that we would have to chase that with ever-growing energy supplies from oil, coal, nuclear power, what have you. And he asked a couple of basic questions. First, what in the world are we going to use all that energy for? And second is, couldn't we do more with less and maybe follow a curve more like the blue line? And I got to tell you, at the time, that was absolute heresy. And he was attacked from every direction. You remember, John. Uh, and you know he stood up and fought off those, those critics. And in hindsight, it's interesting to see that the actual US energy demand and consumption follows the, the solid black line. This isn't quite updated. Uh, it's continued to decline slightly uh, since the last update there. And so it's still tracking a little bit above that uh, blue line that Amory had projected. Uh, and you know, you might argue that he was right for all the wrong reasons, but it's kind of hard to argue that those critics were that wrong for all the right reasons. Um, but the key thing was that Amory introduced the idea uh, of energy efficiency as a resource and the idea that technology and um, innovation in policy and in business models to support that technology uh, could actually help us uh, deliver ever more services with the same or less energy resources. So at the time, I was an undergrad. And uh, after taking Gil Master's environment class, I signed up for his brand new first edition of CE 176. Uh, and the textbook was there on the lower right. Um, and the topic of the course was what we called alternative energy. Uh, it was about energy efficient buildings and, and solar heating and that sort of a thing, which didn't really fit with, with something you could, <clears throat> you could describe in an energy catalog at the time. And so the title of the course, and this is on my transcript, it was Designs for Alternative Lifestyles. Uh, that, that shows you how, uh, how mainstream and, and how um, accepted uh, the ideas of uh, alternative energy were at the time. Um, Gil went on to, uh, with his colleagues, update the book. Uh, that's the gray uh, image in the middle. And then more recently, uh, his recent editions of the CE 176A course has used this uh, textbook that he co-authored with a, with a former student. And I um, shamelessly stole uh, not only the uh, material from the book, but also his teaching materials for a course that I introduced up at Western Washington. I'll talk about that in a minute. So as John said, I came back, uh, did a second tour at Stanford as a PhD student. Um, I like to say I did IPER before IPER. I did a dissertation on carbon offsets where I um, analyzed uh, both uh, the emission reductions of an electric utility in the United States and a set of conservation and forestry projects in Central America to uh, consider the supply and demand side of a potential offset transaction. At the time, this cartoon appeared in the San Jose Mercury that um, pretty well encapsulated both the promise and the pitfalls of uh, international carbon trading. And I remember John saying at, at my defense, you know, if you'd drawn that cartoon, I'd sign your dissertation just for that. Uh, but I didn't, so I had to do all the number crunching. Eventually, they passed me anyway. So later, I was working at the UN Environment Program and, and still uh, very much interested in this the idea of efficiency as a resource and in um, integrating energy systems. Uh, and I worked uh, with a Brazilian colleague and another uh, former Stanford student, uh, Bob Renlinger, who I think works for Apple these days, uh, on a textbook on integrated electric resource planning. Um, integrated meaning integrating the supply side and the demand side and breaking through the, uh, again, conventional wisdom of uh, planning is, is just about uh, 
supply chasing demand and trying to keep up. So let me, uh, this is complicated. So um, most of the decade of the 2000s, I spent at Rocky Mountain Institute, which is the nonprofit organization in Colorado that was co-founded by Amory Levins. And uh, again, we were co-conspirators there. And the mission there is really all about uh, energy efficiency as a resource and finding ways to advance um, that resource with serious clients um, in industry, buildings, uh, government, et cetera. One of the most impactful things we did was, uh, I think it was 2003, uh, we convened uh, what we call a design charrette. It's, it's basically an intense interdisciplinary brainstorming workshop kind of like a hackathon, I suppose, except not necessarily focusing on software. Uh, it's actually just down the road here in San Jose. Looking at energy consumption in data centers, which in the early days of data centers, which were basically warehouses full of servers, so they basically designed them like big warehouses and uh, with the energy systems uh, to match. And the concern was that these things were so energy inefficient and the demand was growing so fast that before long, data centers would be using the entire electricity production of the United States. And so we found that, A, that wasn't really true, but B, that there was potential with just off-the-shelf technology to improve the energy efficiency of data centers by almost an order of magnitude, I mean like 88, 89%. And that's without any fancy measures like software virtualization that could take the efficiency improvements even farther. And many of those recommendations uh, and strategies were adopted pretty uh, swiftly and almost all voluntarily by the industry, led by firms like uh, Hewlett Packard and others. And so we really felt like we had moved the ball down the field on data center efficiency. Another project, um, we were thinking about the integration of energy systems. And um, at the time, people were talking, starting to talk about you know, the smart grid and the, the smart house and the smart car, and I thought, well, you know, the place where the grid meets the house and the car is your garage. So we probably just need a smart garage. So we started calling the project the smart garage, and we were looking at the potential for connecting grid, building, and vehicle through electric vehicles and, and charging, and the fact that you've got these grid-connected batteries that are generally not on the road 23 out of 24 hours of, of the day, and the potential for those interconnections to make it possible to make the vehicle way cleaner and more efficient, and the grid cleaner and more efficient by adding a connection with that storage element and making it easier, for example, to integrate renewable sources. And I, I have to admit, at the time I was running around talking to utilities about things like vehicle to grid technology and so forth, a, a little premature. Um, but still, the, um, the integration idea, I think, was pretty sound. So after that, I came back to Stanford for another tour, uh, teaching part-time, and I did a couple of courses. Uh, one was uh, building on that um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, utility planning theme, did a course on power sector resource planning, um, and co-taught that with a colleague named Ren Orens. Ren uh, was the co-founder of a prominent consulting firm, E3, Energy and Environmental Economics. And um, one of the students in the class, of course, stood out and Ren hired him to be part of E3. Uh, his name's Zach Ming, and he now teaches a course on electricity economics. I think it's 173S, 273S. Um, and it's basically the first half of this course uh, that, we, that Ren and I were doing uh, a few years back. The second half of the course uh, went <clears throat> kind of beyond the classroom theory and um, took a real electric utilities resource plan and then tried to hack it and say, okay, use the tools from our course and the, the quantitative methods and so forth and make it cleaner, make it cheaper, make it more reliable, you choose. Uh, but uh, the idea was to really have that kind of hands-on exercise. So on the screen, it's, it's my image. Should the slide be up there? 
It's okay? Okay. I mean, I'm not that good looking. I think you'd rather see that. The other class I taught at the time was a course called Greenhouse Gas Mitigation, which was kind of a fun course because we went across all the different sectors, whether it's buildings, transportation, industry, electricity, and also the land use sectors of, of farms, forests, and, and uh, grazing lands, and looked at how to reduce emissions, how to count emissions, how to monetize reductions, uh, strategies like carbon offsets, and so forth, uh, kind of bringing in some of those uh, concepts from uh, my dissertation, but also, again, look at, looking at uh, whole system integration. Okay. So around that time, actually during the, the last year I was teaching at Stanford in that, that previous era, um, there was an event um, convened by the, the design school, the D school. And it was about reimagining undergraduate education at Stanford in 2025, which then was a, you know, quite a ways into the future. And uh, they came up with some really interesting insights, uh, and there's a whole report about that. Um, but I just summarized it briefly here with a, a couple of the graphics uh, showing a couple of their points. And, and the, the bottom line was what they said is, well, rather than the traditional model where a student arrives and they declare a major, and then they work within that discipline to collect knowledge in that field, and then they graduate and leave, and that's it. Rather than that, the um, reimagined educational model is to say, okay, students will arrive and declare a mission, and then they'll work to acquire skills and tools with which to carry out that mission, and then they'll leave, but then they'll come back to study or to teach. And it would be a much more fluid model. And the disciplinary boundaries would be much more fluid. And we'd break out of our silos uh, a little bit. And it would be, at least from the student standpoint, mission driven. And that really kind of stuck with me. I thought that, that actually is the way I see education. I, I, I guess I was also biased by my um, kind of uh, sneaky interdisciplinary approach in, in my PhD. But I ended up uh, at Western Washington University, which is up in Bellingham, Washington. Um, if you don't know where that is, if, if you look out the window to the north, you can see mountains. And those are the mountains uh, that are the backdrop for Vancouver, Canada. So if someone's from the northwest, we're northwest of them. Western is a comprehensive university. So Stanford, for example, is a research university. Uh, there's also liberal, liberal arts colleges. Um, liberal arts colleges just grant BA degrees, BS degrees. Research university, of course, has bachelor's, master's, terminal degrees, including PhDs. Comprehensive university is kind of a mama bear. It's in between. We grant bachelor's and master's degrees, but we don't have terminal degrees. We don't have PhD students. And you can imagine that changes the business model, so to say, for research. For the faculty, it changes research a lot. If you don't have PhD students who are around for you know, four or five, six years, you have master's students who are there for a year or two, or, or, or you're getting research work out of an undergrad. But it's also a different business model for the students. And, and frankly, uh, for the undergrads, uh, it can be really beneficial to have uh, much more contact with the faculty <laughs> just out of necessity uh, because they don't have the uh, advanced PhD students uh, to um, share their research work with. Some of the things that Western does pretty well, and, it, and it's um, as comprehensive universities go, I think it's, it's typically rated in the Western US as, as one and two with uh, Cal Poly. So we're, we're, um, we're kind of well regarded in our niche. But the things that it, that it em emphasizes is uh, experiential learning and collaborative learning, uh, including undergrads in research. Uh, again, that's partly making lemonade, but it's also by design. Uh, and really engaging the community um, and uh, the campus in, in service learning uh, as part of the experiential aspect. 
uh, a sustainability focus actually using the campus as a laboratory. I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a minute. Um, with a whole uh, array of interdisciplinary programs, including energy studies, but also entrepreneurship and others. Uh, and then a global perspective. Western is actually known for its prodigious output of uh, Peace Corps volunteers. So I was thinking about those things, and I, and I put those values in the left-hand um, column here. And just after I started there, I observed um, this thing that happened with uh, President Obama convened a bunch of the engineering deans from all around the country uh, with the idea of advocating for educating tomorrow's engineers to meet the grand challenges of, of our time and, and our generation, like climate change, for example. And the um, engineering deans uh, signed on to a pledge to um, improve engineering education in a way that would fulfill that um, aspiration. And the things that they, that they offered to do uh, in, in this pledge was to create research opportunities for undergraduates and to offer more experiential learning and working in interdisciplinary topics, uh, including service learning with, with clients and, and mentors in the local community, uh, incorporating entrepreneurship uh, in the program and having a, a global perspective. And, you know, I looked at this list and I thought, that sounds familiar. That sounds a lot like us. And so, hmm, maybe I'm not in this little backwater uh, comprehensive university. Maybe I'm out in front of all those engineering deans, you know, eat my dust, MIT, right? Um, maybe this is an asset. And then what what I need to do and what we need to do in, in building uh, an energy program that we aspire to is to take those assets that we have and, and add some technical content to really fill in uh, the material that the profession needs. Uh, and so we set about to create uh, a portfolio of uh, curriculum and degree programs including a couple of BA degrees. Uh, this is the catalog page for our BS degree in energy science and technology. If you squint, you can see some of the text there. Probably sounds like me preaching the gospel about um, uh, becoming leaders in Washington's emerging clean energy economy and uh, all that sort of a, a thing that uh, is. What we were hearing was also needed from the profession and from our advisors. And to support those degrees, of course, we had math classes and we had physics classes and econ and all those things. But we designed a series of courses that were probably a little different from what you see in most university catalogs. Uh, sorry for the busy slide. I highlighted uh, a handful of some of the courses titles in red there. So if you just kind of squint at those, you can, you can see that. But you, know, you can see a few things, that the courses are not discipline driven. They're not building on you know, Chem 101, Chem 201. Rather, they're, they're problem based. But they're not focused on problems. They're focused on solutions, and particularly solutions to the challenge of decarbonizing the energy economy and averting climate change. And so um, you'll also see that I stole liberally uh, from the Stanford catalog, uh, including some of my own classes, which I taught uh, for a few years at Western and then turned them over to um, other faculty whom we had hired. Uh, I also stole, of course, uh, Gil Masters' courses uh, and taught my version of them and then turned them over to the faculty. Uh, I added some other courses in the, in the building energy uh, arena. Uh, and then we created some other um, new titles uh, that... Um, Again, we're in response to uh, the interests of our professional advisor, things like community solutions to climate change, really focusing on the perspective of a city, thinking about how do we reduce the carbon footprint of our operation and our citizens, uh, thinking about energy management and organizations down at the bottom uh, from the perspective of running a business or a campus. How do I manage uh, energy efficiency, procurement, 
standards, um, all kinds of, of um, topics at the intersection of the, the technical requirements and the business requirements. Uh, and so we created these courses to populate uh, those degrees, uh, both the BA and the BS side uh, that we had designed. One of the things we needed is more hands-on opportunities. Uh, again, that was kind of the, the theme and, and the expectation working at Western. And the state of Washington's pretty stingy, so they weren't about to build me any like laboratory building or something like that. But we realized that as we observed energy efficiency as one of our biggest resources, and energy efficiency in existing buildings, the biggest part of that, uh, it occurred to us that well, we've got existing buildings, and they're not particularly efficient, and we've got some really astute energy engineers in the campus facilities team, and luckily for us, and unlike some other campuses I'd, I'd been on, uh, they were actually really keen to work with the faculty and the students. And so we created this idea of campus as a lab where we literally do our energy in the built environment courses with labs going into our own buildings and looking at, okay, how do you audit a building? How do you do an energy audit? How do you um, identify and quantify energy efficiency retrofits and upgrades? And, and we end up with the students actually helping write applications for funding to the state and the utilities for upgrades to our buildings and actually becoming an asset to the um, facilities engineers themselves. And so we have this sort of triangular relationship between the you know, student activist programs and the facilities hands-on uh, activities in the, um, in the campus and the coursework. And, th and the key to it is that we pledge to the facilities team that the students we send to them will be an asset, not a burden, because they'll know their stuff, having been through some of that coursework. And of course, they'll learn a lot more, uh, but in a way that, that, that they're asking smart questions, you know, not, not basic questions. And so the campus has a lab strategy. You know, it's partly making lemonade out of the fact that uh, state funding is, is uh, rather uh, stingy, but it's also part of the uh, approach that we're using. And we were doing all of this in consultation with an advisory board that we convened, which is really kind of a who's who of the energy profession all across Washington and the Northwest. And what they were saying is, you know, we need something different in addition to the graduates whom we can already hire from, you know, the engineering school of the University of Washington or the business school there or there and those sorts of things. And so what they call for is really a program that's explicitly interdisciplinary. And so we're trying to break down those, those discipline silos, but we're also trying to hack the interdisciplinary enterprise. Because I remembered when I was at RMI and, and hiring dozens of recent graduates, you know, and people would come with an interdisciplinary, you know, environmental studies or something like that. You know, and we'd have a great conversation, <laughs> but I never hired a one of them. I'd always end up hiring the engineering grad or the business or the hard science student and maybe be a little frustrated that their background was a little narrow and, you know, we'd find the polymath and, and try to kind of expand their dimensions. Um, but the idea was that the interdisciplinary model also had to be upgraded to make sure the students came out with a real skill set and, and the ability to get through that interview that those students didn't get with, with me and hit the ground running day one. We also wanted the program to be uh, experiential, uh, bringing in um, the, the um, undergrad research, uh, the, the problem or really solution-based coursework, uh, linking to our campus as a lab work and the entrepreneurship program on campus. And in doing that, we found that we actually had to uh, teach a little bit differently because we were, we were teaching a broad range of technical topics and bringing in business concepts and policy concepts and uh, teaching them with a, a pretty wide range of student backgrounds. And, uh, you know, Western has a lot of first-gen uh, uh, college students and, and a lot of students who are 
kind of playing catch-up ball from maybe not the best high school preparation, and we couldn't overwhelm them with, with prerequisites. And so we were designing some of these technical-oriented courses to be as accessible as possible. Um, and that was actually consistent with the type of material that we wanted to teach that was, that was more about uh, systems thinking and about synthesis, maybe a little higher on Bloom's taxonomy, if you know it, that uh, uh, thinking about uh, teaching. Um, but, but we had that, that course list that I show you were actually different uh, types of, of courses. And then there was the, the um, approach of being mission driven and really looking at um, helping students become leaders in the clean energy transition to avert climate change. Okay, so let's talk about that mission a little bit. Um, when you think about decarbonizing the economy, there's really things, three, what I call pillars, or key strategies. Continued and accelerated improvement in energy efficiency, dare I call it extreme energy efficiency. Decarbonizing the power supply, and we're certainly making steady progress on that. And electrification of fossil end uses that now are, are uh, direct um, uses of fossil energy like transport and heating. I don't know about y'all, but if you saw the Super Bowl, I think there were four car ads and three of them were only electric. BMW, Chevrolet, there's one other one. Um, so we're making progress there. And of these pillars, it seems like the second and third one on the supply side uh, are pretty uh, fully covered uh, here at Stanford and in academia generally, but energy efficiency, much less so. And you might ask, well, you know, if you've got that zero carbon power supply and you're going to electrify with it, you're, you're aiming for zero carbon, what do you need energy efficiency for? Who cares how much you use? And um, I don't think that's the right answer. If you look at a building, for example, and you want to have a net zero building, so you put so solar panels on the roof. And how many can you put on the roof? And if you want to make that building actually net zero and supplied fully by those solar panels, you got to shrink the demand. You've got to make the energy use more efficient in order to balance supply and demand. And you really have to think about the whole economy that way. And then the other aspects of it are how fast can you uh, grow the renewable supply? Uh, you know, something like 1%, 1.5% a year of decarbonization would probably be what you could achieve with maximum growth in renewables. And, and you need more than that. You combine that with aggressive energy efficiency, you could get further. You'd also save money. The efficiency resource continues to be uh, our least cost energy resource. And then finally, at some point, you're going to have constraints even on the renewable energy supply and whether it's, it's in land or other environmental impacts. And so bottom line, if we want to decarbonize the economy, the efficiency resource is really key to it. And if you look at some of the studies of deep decarbonization strategies, it's really interesting. They go into great detail and all kinds of trade-offs between these different supply options and how fast can you phase out coal and oil and you know, uh, how fast can you build the renewables and then you know, integrating wind and solar and the, and the time variations and do you need storage and, and do you have to rely on other resources? Do you have to go to uh, carbon sequestration and, and all of these different things? And they kind of treat efficiency as, as exogenous. And these days, at least, there's an assumption that there is some energy efficiency progress built in to the baseline scenario, but it, it's, it's generally not treated as as an option to go further. This is a, a reproduction of a couple graphics from a study by the advocacy group, uh, American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, where they actually took the typical baseline study where maybe uh, you know 20% of the reductions are from energy efficiency and, and said according to their analysis of potential, you could get probably half of the uh, reductions from efficiency. And then they had a whole pie chart there of the different policy options, and you can see how it boils down to one or two silver bullets, right? 
Yeah, I'm afraid not. It's actually just a little of this and a little of that in a whole portfolio of different options. But the, the bottom line is we're not really treating the energy efficiency resource with, with due respect. This is a, a survey that was conducted by uh, a collaborative of the University Energy Institute directors. Uh, and they, they, were, they were just trying to collect data on what everyone is doing. They sent around this survey, which energy resource does your institute primarily work on? And, and I looked at that and I'm, well, gee, you know, I've been walking around speaking and, and quacking about, you know, we have probably the most comprehensive undergraduate energy program in the country. And like, the only thing I could check on this graph, on this survey was other, you know, we do energy efficiency and demand response and utility systems and, and resource planning, electrification and, and climate mitigation, decarbonization, everything from the system perspective. And it's not just about extraction of a resource. And I realize we're kind of outliers in that perspective. Uh, and, and it's true, it, it's, it's a unique perspective. And to really address the challenge of decarbonization and, and in particular capturing the efficiency resource, you really need to think differently. And so to, to challenge our academic resources to think differently, shouldn't be that big a deal at Stanford because it's been done before. I remember as an undergrad, the cool course that everyone wanted to take, and if you were an engineer, you could get in, but the other people had to get on the waiting list was Mechanical Engineering 101, Visual Thinking, where they integrated drawing and design, and it was just the beginning of a whole um, evolution of what became the idea of design thinking and the D school, the design school, um, and, and really, uh, you know, just a whole conceptual framework. And they focused a lot on the process, you know, the, the rapid prototyping, all that sort of thing. Uh, and, and I think we're, we're thinking about design, but also more about what you design. But that was, one, that was one key paradigm. The other is entrepreneurial thinking, coming out of the business school. And, and, and Stanford is the wellspring of Silicon Valley and, and, and uh, all of the um, uh, uh, conceptual uh, brainstorming and everything that, that comes out of that and, and, and pivoting and, and the whole entrepreneurial uh, kind of playbook. And so this idea of a new thinking paradigm is not new to Stanford. So with that as background, uh, we're offering now uh, a couple of modest contributions um, together with Amory Lovins uh, and uh, our other colleague, Holmes Hummel. Uh, we're co-teaching this course called Extreme Energy Efficiency. And it's CE 107R, 207R uh, this quarter and also next quarter. So advertisement if you're interested in, in the course. And what we do is a deep dive on integrative design for energy efficiency. So we're not teaching the engineering concepts behind energy technology, um, but we, we present uh, energy technology in all different sectors, from buildings to industry, transport, electricity, materials, all of those things. And then we do a series of class exercises where each class session is kind of like a mini hackathon. Uh, and, the, and the students are posed uh, what we call a puzzler uh, that they have to solve to redesign some kind of system from a very first principles standpoint. And the idea is to open up uh, the thinking process, but also to recognize the potential that exists for the energy efficiency resource. Uh, and it's a class that's uh, obviously uh, familiar material to engineers, but it's open to students from all majors. And maybe this is a model for the type of new thinking, uh, for example, for Stanford's new school. Another uh, allied course, also taught by our colleague Holmes Hummel and another colleague, Anthony Kinslow, is on the equity aspects of the clean energy transition. It's called the quest for an inclusive clean energy economy and, and recognizing that the clean energy transition has to take place in parallel with breaking down the 
uh, severe inequality in, in our economy. So in this design class, integrative design for extreme energy efficiency, um, it, it's kind of hard to encapsulate uh, the approach, but a few of the, what we call pillars of the uh, integrative design method are really setting aside your uh, assumptions, starting what we call beginner's mind, and really taking a focus from, from the end use. What is the service that you're trying to provide, not jumping to the technology? Um, bringing in unusual sources of knowledge, like emulating natural processes, even though you might be talking about a building or a vehicle, uh, and re relying on actual data, not rules of thumb, uh, and using, using that. Um, for feedback and, and learning and so forth. And so these are, are concepts that we used in many of our client engagements at Rocky Mountain Institute and that, that Amory has been um, engaging with now for decades. Who do we teach this stuff to? Well, okay, engineers, of course, but this is where Amory and I actually have a little bit of a disagreement. He thinks that there's, there's so much energy inefficiency and bad design out there because engineers are doing the wrong thing that they learned in school. And as a graduate with three degrees from Stanford School of Engineering and, and uh, experience teaching here, I kind of have to defend the profession a little bit. Um, and my thought is that engineers design what they're assigned to design. And they start with the assumptions that they're handed. And if they're just repeating past designs, that's because that was what the management asked for. And so we think that these, these materials and these methods need to be available to and offered to decision makers, managers, entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs who are trying to innovate in established organizations, and really anybody who's declared the clean energy mission going back to our, our first um, exercise from, from a few years back. And so it, it also opens up the possibility of of taking a new approach to teaching some of these topics, as I mentioned before, uh, where the, the engineering content, the technical content, can be made more accessible to people with a wider range of backgrounds because it's not all dependent on everybody has to have you know, 30 credits of advanced college math. Uh, and rather, we focus more on, on synthesis and on design thinking um, and um, bringing in uh, again, a wider range of concepts uh, from, the, from the policy and, and business side. So this kind of brings me back to thinking about where we've been um, in our, our uh, experiment in trying to build this interdisciplinary energy program at Western Washington University and you know, how that might relate to uh, what Stanford's doing now with this new school that's under development. And it, it seems to me that we really have we have an obligation to help prepare you all as future leaders in this clean energy transition um, and that you have a, a mindset to go out and find solutions that integrate the technical, the business, the policy, the equity aspects of energy, including the demand side and energy efficiency as a resource, and that that enterprise is, is explicitly interdisciplinary, uh, again, not in the old way of a little of this and a little of that, but, but in, in the, the new interdisciplinary approach that really that provides uh, solutions, and that uh, a program of this sort ought to be incorporating experiential learning and hands-on uh, experiences that really address these, these problems and solutions. Uh, including, for example, integrative design for extreme energy efficiency, but also some of these other uh, models that Stanford has pioneered in, in design thinking, in entrepreneurial thinking, and that they all work pretty well hand in hand. Um, and they can be complemented, uh, particularly with the uh, experiential approach, by co-curricular activities uh, outside the classroom. And so it seems to me that what Stanford's embarking on here um, is uh, a much more generously resourced version of what we've been through at, at Western. And judging from the reception that we've gotten, uh, particularly from our, our professional uh, advisors, uh, we think that it's the right path 
and uh, hopefully our uh, couple of new courses that we've introduced uh, are, are a good start and a, and a model for adding some of the new material that uh, fulfills some of these uh, aspirations. So if you're interested, we'll be teaching extreme energy efficiency again in the spring. Please come and, and join us. Uh, otherwise, I'll turn it over for questions. Great. Thanks very much, Thanks. Joel. Uh, that was great. And as predicted, you uh, once again are uh, you and your group uh, ahead of your time, if I must say so myself. Um, so I think a lot of food for thought in there. There are a few things going on that you probably all know about that are uh, simpatico and consistent with this. But I think I really appreciate the big picture look from soup to nuts about how to do this, particularly the goal of the new school uh, being to scale things up much more rapidly than we've been able to do before, which does require uh, a different way of putting the disciplines together because academia is too slow to adjust in interdisciplinary ways, number one. And number two, working with stakeholders in the business community at the NGOs and whatnot, the kinds of things you did at RMI. So we have time for a few general questions and then we'll break for the student session. Any comments, suggestions? What did he say? I think you'll probably take a lot from this May take a while. I mean, is, is this new? Is this stuff you've already figured out? Or is uh, <laughs> I think some of the principles, yes, but not the de implementation details. Okay. So for me, that's what I really loved about this talk, is I was kind of saying, well, maybe a little bit of that, a little bit of this, but you've actually tried some specific uh, implementation pathways, if I could call it that, at the academic level. So I think that, to me, is really valuable. So. In addition to the class, I think we will, uh, as a community, be picking our brain on how to do this and hopefully it'll help us uh, do, it, do it as well as we can. The nice thing about this experience Joel's have is he didn't get everything right, but he got a lot of big things right. And that actually were the things that you even started with that really mm -hmm. have changed the world and could change it in, in a, a more uh, sustainable direction. So any takers on questions for the audience? Joel's a hard guy to uh, hard guy to follow and a hard guy to uh, interact with. Any anybody want to ask a general question? I'm sure the students who will meet with you. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is a little sub part I think of your talk, but there was a slide on like greenhouse gas mitigation, um, and I was, I wanted to understand the numbering because you have it like five, four, three, two, and then four that came down. Oh, okay. That, that was actually a, a graphic I stole from Hal Harvey at uh, Energy Innovation. But the idea was that, that if you want to have deep decarbonization and, and reducing, you know, the 40 gigaton uh, global uh, emission footprint, uh, you're not going to get it all in one sector. Uh, you really need substantial reductions in buildings through energy efficiency in particular, in vehicles, in electric power, in industry. Also, on the land, in, in agriculture, soil carbon, forestry, uh, rangelands. And, and all of those seemed, at least in, in Hal's formulation, and I kind of agree, that you know, a few gigatons each, which is really big. It's, you know, we're, we're talking about a really huge, dramatic change, but technically feasible, and maybe even economically attractive. Uh, and if you add all of those up, you know, then you're, you're kind of in the ballpark of the sort of deep decarbonization uh, targets that we're talking about, you know, to meet the, the goals of the Paris Agreement and, and so forth. Um, and that if you only focused on a couple of sectors, however promising, you know, the, the potential may be, uh, that wouldn't be enough, that you really had to take a comprehensive approach. And that's why we, we did the course the way we did. Uh, Partly it sort of fit in the pedagogy that we were looking at carbon accounting and we were looking at, at uh, you know, reduction potential and, and carbon monetization and all these different uh, sectors, but that they all kind of fit together into uh, a strategy and you could sort of pick and choose which ones you thought were interested to go, interesting to go and, and work on yourself. Yeah, for more on that, there is a great uh, uh, lecture in this seminar by Hal Harvey Oh, okay. where he presented the basics from that book if you want to get into more detail. Again, 
I, you know, they have their own way, as you know, you probably know this more recently than me. If you look at their methodology, it's one way to put the pieces together. I think the nice thing about Joel that, that they learn about and pitch is their approach in his group is this kind of learning and adaptive thing where you are really willing and able to consider a bunch of different ideas and mash them, mash them up in this kind of creative design thinking framework. I don't think Hal was here a little bit before you, I mm -hmm. believe, as a student, so I don't think he really got into that. I, I do have to do one thing to augment what you've already said is there is a group in engineering that does entrepreneurship and design thinking, and that's Stanford Technology Ventures program. It's located right outside the, the door here to the left. I think they could be very useful. You may know that group as the group that runs the Wednesday seminar, normally in this very room, called Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders. So um, who would have thought, Joe, I, I have this impression of Carl Knapp smiling down on <laughs> Who would have thought that Tesla would now be on the order of a trillion dollar market cap company that's now calling the shots for all the other so there's a good example of what you're talking about. Well, and their longtime CTO, J.B. Straubel, was yeah. one of Gill's yeah. students. Yeah, I was going to say, and he was an ME student yeah. who also had a degree in CEE and met Gill Masters. I thought of him exactly when you yeah. mentioned that, among many others, yeah. but certainly him. Great. Okay, so I think we're just about out of time, so we ought to move to the student session. Thanks to you all for coming. Thanks for one good question, and Joel, thanks for a very uh, entertaining, provocative, and thought uh, thought expanding uh, talk today. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, John.